I now want to look at a rather intriguing attempt to try and understand why that huge rise in population occurred 250 years ago. In a book by Thomas McEwan, who is a medical historian, called The Modern Rise of Population. It's a short book and um, interesting for its methodology because the methodology he adopts is that of Sherlock Holmes. In a famous passage in, I think, uh, Scarlet in, uh, Study in Scarlet, Holmes uh, advocates to Watson, his assistant, the method of exclusion. The method of exclusion is to line up all the possible causes of something, then go through them, and as you check them off, you're left with less and less. So, supposing you're dealing with a murder, you go through each suspect and you check off and you find that they couldn't have committed and you're left. Whoever is left, whatever is left, as Sherlock Holmes says, must be the cause, however improbable. Now there is a fault in this method, as you'll discover, because it all relies on having the right cause in at the beginning. If you've missed out a potential suspect, as I'll try and point out, McEwen does, then you miss the explanation. But using this method of exclusion, McEwen sets up a framework that an epidemiologist would look at disease and specifically what would account for the rapid decline in disease over the last 250 years in many parts of the world. It might be a change in the disease vectors, that is in rat behavior, in lice, in uh, fleas and this sort of thing, or in the bacteria around us or in the viruses that afflict us. And in a chapter in his book, he, he goes through the various kinds of vectors and he finds no evidence in the middle of the 18th century, which is when this begins really, for a decline in any of these. It's very unlikely that viruses suddenly within 50 years all over the world begin to de decline in uh, their killing power. Um, likewise, bacteria continue to be um, problematic. Um, so he can't find any change in the disease vectors which could account on uh, for such a large change in world population. Indeed, as I mentioned last time, you would expect most of these things to get worse as the world population began to grow rather than less. People are more crowded together and so on and so on. So he can't find anything except possibly a little bit of decline in some um, some viral diseases like smallpox and measles because when they become very common in the population then children get them and adults tend to be immune so there might be a little of an effect there. A second area you might look is in the treatment of disease. The, that's either in the change in the formal knowledge about how disease works so that people can treat it better or in better care for the sick i.e hospitals and so on. And he looks at the history of hospitals and the knowledge about disease and rightly concludes that there, this cannot account for the change, the first part of the change, the first hundred years up to 1850-60, for two reasons. One is that the hospitals and the treatment of disease, the hospitals as increasingly now in many hospitals with MRSA and so on, are killing places. If you went to hospital it was uh, probably increased your likelihood of catching a disease for much of history and as it does now um, in many cases. So basically the hospitals were disasters until um, the 1870s, 80s when uh, hospital disinfecting uh, listers, reforms and so on took place. So it can't really explain, the hospitals can't explain this nor can the knowledge about disease. As I mentioned to you last time, it, it, when I started studying the subject, I was amazed at how little was known about disease transmission until just over a hundred years ago. I sort of thought that, well, gradually we understood diseases and by the time of the late 19th century in Cambridge, people would understand many of the major diseases even if they couldn't treat them. But in the great book by Crichton, that's C-R-E-I-G-H-T-O-N, 
who was a demonstrator or lecturer in Cambridge. And he wrote his two great volumes of the history of epidemic diseases based on his lectures in this room and elsewhere, no doubt. And he looked at the major diseases and their causes. And this is 1895, 112 years ago. And he decided, that, that just to, to take a few examples, influenza, what is the cause of influenza? It's caused by earthquakes. Plague and cholera and typhoid, what do, causes these? By decomposing bodies from graveyards, giving off a, a miasma or a sort of um, dust which contaminates people. This is 1895, lecturer in epidemiology in Cambridge. Typhus, cold and poverty. Dysentery, miasma of faecal origin. It does come from the faeces, but it's not because you drink the water from the faeces. It's the faeces themselves give off a, a sort of air. Um, leprosy by eating too much salty meat and by rough clothing which rubs against the body. Malaria, by mal air, um, from the Italian, by fogs, vapors of swamps. So none of these can be cured by medicine and uh, all the causes are wrong. And it's really um, not until the 20th century that uh, we begin to understand how these diseases like malaria and influenza and plague. It's, it's the turn of the 19th century and the early 20th century, often in Japan and often in uh, Europe, that the discoveries were made, plague in Japan and Europe more or less simultaneously. Um, so it can't be to do with knowledge. Environmental changes, well, um, again he can't find anything because there Environmental changes, that is housing, um, sanitation, sewage, clothing, the world we live in. Um, there's no dramatic change in the 18th century to account for that. Um, the purification of water, the efficient disposal of sewage, safe milk, improved housing are things of the later 19th century, Chadwick's reforms. Even then it's quite late. At this point, I always tell a joke, which sometimes you like and sometimes you don't like, but I'll repeat it since it, it tickles my fancy. Um, when Queen Victoria, have I told you this joke? When Queen Victoria came to inspect Cambridge with her very moral Prime Minister, Gladstone, um, Gladstone, who was uh, a, a devout Christian, was guiding her around Cambridge and she stood on one of the bridges, I like to think it was maybe Clare Bridge. She looked down into the can, this is about 1870, and she saw all this paper floating down the can. Um, and she turned to Gladstone and said, Mr. Gladstone, what is this paper floating down the can, filling the camel? Now he knew what it was, it was toilet paper because they were just open sewage from the colleges going straight into the town in 1870. Now he was caught in that great dilemma. If he said to the Queen, who was notoriously prudish, Madam, this is toilet paper, she would have been deeply shocked and perhaps sacked him. On the other hand, as a Christian, he shouldn't really tell a lie, but he opted for the second option. He said, Madam, those are notices saying don't swim in the can. So he avoided it by a brazen lie. Anyway, 1870, the, the colleges were still sending feces into the can. If they were doing it then, they certainly were doing it in 1750. And so, it, um, McEwen says it can't be environmental changes. Now, by the method of elimination, he's, he's got three of them, uh, rid of the three main causes. So what is left? Well, what is left for McEwen is diet, is food. It's well known that if human beings are well fed, they are less diseased or they suffer, uh, they don't die so much and, and so on. So he was left with meat, 
vegetables. It's well known that there was an agricultural revolution in the 19th century, 18th century, in this area particularly, better overwintering of animals, um, better Swedes, potatoes and so on, turnip times, and you may have done all this at school. So basically, the food was getting better, and as a result, people in England, this wouldn't apply so much in anywhere else in the world, which was also going through it, it wasn't a point he, he noticed comparatively, but here anyway, perhaps it was because people were better fed. That was all that was left, it must be that. But, in the 20 years after he wrote his book in the 1970s, there were increasing studies of um, food in the later 18th century, which showed, for instance, if you looked at the recruiting records of, our, of soldiers into the British Army, which give the height and the weight of soldiers in the second half of the 18th century, you find that it, it drops. In other words, people get shorter and lighter. In other words, they've been brought up, probably, with a worse diet. And indeed, all the studies of the effects of the early Industrial Revolution lead us to think that the crowding of people into cities and so on, and the poverty that um, England went through actually worsened the diet of the majority of the English population for about 50 years. It works exactly in the opposite way. There was no pasteurization of milk, so you couldn't drink milk. And so, basically, a few people ate quite well, but many people ate worse. So basically what he's done is as if Sherlock Holmes had gone through all the suspects and got rid of them all. And there's no one left. So he must have missed something. Um, I will come on to the something he missed. I'll leave it hanging just for a minute and I'll now uh, suggest what he missed, which is the most obvious thing in a way.